Well, hello everybody and welcome to my show. My name is Jason DaCosta and this is Consistent Preterism. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Book of the Maccabees uh, and that intertestamental period there that is so dark and quiet. Um, but before I did that, I wanted to briefly touch upon the cover pic of this um, audio. And that pic is a, a picture of basically two maps. And on the bottom map, you can see the... Uh, the uh, roots of Paul, right, and his mission and his disciples and where they ventured to based upon what the Bible tells us. You can see some dotted lines on different journeys that he took um, to different regions in the known empire. And then you can also see some solid lines of areas that he went to. And you can notice like little regions of, of territories and different uh, nations and areas that he stopped and that he went to. And the top map that's right above that is actually a map of the Israelites and where they were located and the Jewish dispersions and scatterings and what places they were in around 1 CE, right? The year one. And if you notice, that's the purple areas. Okay, you can see that in the little grid. But isn't it amazing that the regions that the uh, scattered Israelites were living in, mainly the ones that were most well known and you know, the most population were basically exactly in line with where Paul went. Exactly in line. Okay, if you look at the different journeys he took, you can see that he's basically going to all the regions where they were located. All right, and it might be slightly off because, you know, Paul probably came to be based on the information we have, maybe like mid 30s, late 30s, somewhere in that region. Maybe is that that's when he started? Who knows, right? Really, but. Um, and that was the time 1 CE on the map, you know, was the, the location of where most of these Jews were. So it probably got a little bit more expanded by the time Paul came around. But the general route is there, right? It matches perfectly. You can see he's in Rome. You can see he hits that little island of Crete, um, you know, Turkey, like all that region. Like this is exactly where Paul went, was exactly where the dispersion was. All right. So just another ironclad proof for Israel only. Okay, and, and to show that Paul's whole mission was all Israel saved. That was the sum of all the parts. All right, And that little diagram, those two little maps, um, show that perfectly. And I have to give credit uh, to a friend of mine uh, um, that I email back and forth with. Um, he knows who he is. And uh, he sent me this. And it was just really cool because I had seen maps of this before and they lined up nicely. But this one really shows it well because it's got all of Paul's journeys and you can see that he's just basically looping in and out of all the places where they would be. Um, so yeah, I thought you'd enjoy that. Now, anyways, what I wanted to talk about is this intertestamental period. Now, for anybody who knows anything about the book of the Maccabees, um, you know that it's uh, not included in our Bibles today, but it was included in many Bibles, you know, back in the beginning of times uh, when the biblical times came to be. Um, I shouldn't say biblical times because that's the time the Bible speaks of. I should say that the Bible's history itself as a book, um, you know, many translations did include this, uh, this, these two books, first and second Maccabees. And the reason why these books are important, right, is because they document a very quiet period for, for people when it comes to Israel's history and, and the land of the Jews and everything. It's that intertestamental period, right? Because in the Bible, the Bibles that we have now, they kind of just go quiet at Malachi, right? At the end of Malachi. And then, you know, hunt, uh, three, four hundred years goes by and here you are, you're in the last days and here comes John the Baptist and Jesus. And then all of a sudden the temple's thrown down, thrown down and it's over. But those that period of time in between there is very important to take note of and to know what was going on. Because like any normal, you know, story, if you have a period of 300 years, give or take, that exists between these two periods, well, clearly a lot of stuff probably would go down during the 300 years, right? Just throwing that number out there for, you know, for an example. But this period of time was a very important period of time and it's just removed from the Bible now, you know? And of course, not all of them included it because there were arguments over, was it inspired? And, you know, these are just men who are making these decisions. But regardless, 
as to whether or not you think it's inspired or not, one thing you can agree on is that it contains some valuable historical information and it sheds a tremendous amount of light as to what was going on with the Jews, with the, the nation of Israel, with the Israelites, okay, and what they were doing and what they weren't doing as well during that time frame, the, the couple hundred years or so leading up to Christ, all right? Now, why is that important to, to take note of, to, to have in there? Well, it's important because you don't come into the last days, to the, to the period just before the temple fell. You're not coming into that blind, totally blind, right? You're not coming into that uh, without the facts, right? If you knew what was going on during the intertestamental period and the, the time of Antiochus, Epiphanes, and that age then when you get to the last days and you start seeing these things taking place and this mission going out to seek the elect, the sheep, the uncircumcised lost sheep of Israel, you would know very well why that happened, right? You'd have a backstory. You'd have a little bit of previous history over the previous couple centuries, right? Which would kind of answer a lot of questions, right? But what are the books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees? The books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees are early Jewish writings detailing the history of the Jews in the 1st century BC. Both books are part of the canon of scripture in the Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Coptic, and Russian Orthodox churches, but they're not recognized as canon by Protestants or Jews. All right, the books outline the history of the Maccabees, who were Jewish leaders who led a rebellion of the Jews against the Seleucid dynasty from around 175 BC to 134 BC. So roughly a 40 year period of time from 175 BC to 134 BC, the, this first book, okay, documents, or these two books document. That's a pretty important time frame, right? Because that's close to when Christ comes, you know? I mean, it's, it's close enough to make this all work, all right? Now, if this is the sort of the kickstarting event this period here, these 40 years, if that's what pushed many, many waves of Israelites out into the nations, okay, again, and caused them to become Greek and to adapt to Greek cultures and lifestyles and, you know, stop observing the Sabbath and reverse their circumcision and refuse circumcision. If all these things are true and they took place around that time, let's just say 175 to 200 years before Christ, well, that kind of makes sense, right? Because you'd have a good, uh, let's see, based on biblical standards, a good five generations or so, right? You'd have five generations or so until the time of Christ, at least four, probably five generations. And you could understand how if Israelites had become, you know, taken in, into the Greek culture and ado adopted Greek lifestyles and things, that probably would, you know, expand pretty well over the course of four to five centuries, right? And we know that by the first century uh, and the time of Christ, there were over a million uh, Jews living in, I think it was Egypt alone, right? So you can see how there's major populations of these people living all over the place uh, in and around that, that time frame when Jesus came to be. So, you know, the scatterings were definitely big. But... Um, you know, the, the first book of the Maccabees portrays the efforts by the Jews to regain their religious independence from, Epip from Antiochus Epiphanes after his desecration of the temple. The second book consists of a Greek synopsis of, five, of a five-volume history of the Maccabean Revolt written by Jason of Cyrene. Um, the first book, although written from a biased perspective, doesn't really mention divine intervention. Um, and the second book has more of a theological slant advancing several doctrine, doctrines followed by the Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches. The first book of the Maccabees was actually written in Hebrew and later translated into Greek. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on you know what was going on there, The, uh, in the 2nd century BC, Judea existed between the Egyptian Ptolemaic Kingdom and the Syrian Seleucid Empire. And uh, Judea fell under the control of the Seleucids in approximately 200 BC, so a couple hundred years before Christ. And during this time, many Jews began to adopt a Greek lifestyle and the Greek culture uh, in order to gain economic and political influence. They avoided circumcision and they advocated abolishing Jewish religious laws. 
right? And that, when you think about that, just 200 years before Christ, many of these Israelites are avoiding circumcision and advocating to abolish the Jewish law system, to do away with it, to not abide by it anymore, okay? So you can see that the movement is already being made here, all right? And they're considering abandoning the, this law, right? Which was a curse if you did so. And then Antiochus Epiphanes became the ruler of the Seleucid Empire in around 175 BC. He was uh, very inconsiderate of the views of the religious Jews. Uh, to him, the office of the high priest was merely, you know, a local appointee, while to Orthodox Jews, the high priest was divinely appointed. Antiochus appointed a high priest named Jason, that's me, uh, who was a Hellenized Jew, and he promptly abolished the Jewish theocracy, followed by a man named Menelaus, who had the rightful high priest Onias murdered. Uh, let's see what else we could tell you. After Menelaus' brother stole articles from the temple, a civil war broke out between the Hellenized Jews and the religious Jews. Antiochus subsequently attacked Jerusalem, pillaged the temple, and killed and captured many of the women and children. He banned all traditional Jewish religious practice, outlawing Jewish sacrifices, Sabbaths, feasts, and most importantly, circumcision, which was the sign of the covenant between the people and their God. He established altars to Greek gods upon which unclean animals were sacrifices. Were sacrificed. Now, this is, you know, not even 200 years before Paul comes along, roughly. And Antiochus Epiphanes is, is, is establishing Greek altars all over the empire. And he's, he's basically forbidding Jews and Israelites to worship their God and rather to you know, sacrifice unclean animals upon these altars to these unknown gods. Well, if you think about Acts chapter 17, what's going on? <laughs> Paul approaches a group of people who are worshiping on an altar to an unknown God. I mean, that is just a perfect picture of what's being done here. All right? And it was all kind of kicked off in this you know, Hellenization period where Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes was, you know, erecting all these things all over the empire. It just really makes perfect sense, right? Paul's going out to them and saying, hey, you guys know the true God, but here you are, you're sacrificing on an altar to an unknown God, right? What are you doing? Right? We're the sons of that God. So, and, and then he talks about when God divided the land for them and everything and, you know, stuff like that. But that's Acts 17. And I have a, a video on that if you're interested in more. But, uh, so anyways, yeah. So then there was this, you know, revolt, rebellion, I guess you would call it, by these hero Jews who rebelled against this whole movement, right? Um... You know, the Maccabees, they march into Jerusalem, they cleanse the temple, they restore the practices. And the festival of Hanukkah commemorates the cleansing and rededication of the Jewish temple. Um, and then you have the second book of the Maccabees, which was written in Koine Greek, most likely around the time of 100 BC. And this uh, jives with 1st Maccabees, but it's sort of written as a theological interpretation of the Maccabean revolt. So in addition to outlining the historical events, the second book discusses doctrinal issues, including prayers and sacrifices for the dead, intercession for the saints, and resurrection on Judgment Day, which, of course, they, they always look forward to. Um, you know, so anyways. But the, the point is, is that this isn't... this These books that outline such an important um, period in history... They, uh, they're non-existent in our Bibles today. And imagine if they were, right? Like if these books existed, say, say they were just like thrown in there after the book of Malachi, right? Before the New Testament. Well, you'd have a pretty darn good look at a very important period in Israel's history in between when the prophets go dark or cold or silent and when Jesus comes. And that would set the stage, would it not, for this gospel mission to go out to these surrounding areas in the Greek Empire and in the Roman Empire, which obviously prior to that it was the Greek Empire, and to 
you know, preach this message that God has forgiven them of their trespasses of the law. I mean, come on. All right, Paul tells the Ephesians that he has uh, done away with the commandments contained in ordinances in his flesh. He tells the Colossians that he, he has forgiven them of their uncircumcision trespass, trespass. They were uncircumcised in the flesh and they were guilty for it and Christ has forgiven that. And he has nailed the handwritten requirements of the law to the cross. He is the end of the law to those who believe. There is therefore now no condemnation under the law for those who believe in Christ. I mean, this is the message, folks. He was born into the law to redeem those under the law. He's going out. The mission is going out to seek the Israelites, to seek the elect from the four winds of the earth. And the two books of the Maccabees set that stage beautifully, just not even two centuries before Christ. And they show that this is indeed what happened in that time frame and in that area with the people. They were being forced to give up certain practices. They were being forced to give up circumcision and Sabbath work, Sabbath observance and feast day observance and all these things. And if you read some of the horrific stories, if you haven't read the book of the Maccabees, there's some pretty horrific stories in there about what would happen to them if they were caught, you know, doing these things or caught, you know, observing the Jewish law. You know, some pretty pretty bad stuff. So they were, and there's actually accounts in the book of the Maccabees that say they were actually reversing their circumcision. I mean, they were, imagine that, like they were circumcised and they were so, uh, so dedicated to now take over the Greek way of life that they were uncircumcising. They were reversing their circumcision. Ouchie. Okay? So, but the point is, is that these books are considered true, historical, accurate accounts of that time frame. So whether or not you think they're inspired or not, right? I mean, at this point, the Bible's just kind of looking like a big ball of supernatural fun stories, right? But whether you think it's inspired or not isn't the issue. The issue is, is that it's a book that gives great detail into the situation of Israel and the people as we come approaching the days of Christ. And I think it should be there. And if it was there, I think that people would have probably been able to put this together long before, right? Now, obviously, a lot of the black Hebrew Israelites and, you know, cult movements like that who think they're, you know, spiritual Israelites or whatever, or d actual descendants of Abraham, you know, these groups, they see the book of the Maccabees and they understand and they actually use it a lot while they're defending their view. But the thing that they don't realize is the time statements, the end, the cap, when it all came to a close, they were in the last days. You know, they, they think that we're in the last days. So they're basically just... Um, Israel only futurists, which is, of course, completely wrong. So, uh, yeah, so that's basically it, folks. I wanted to call some attention to the book of the Maccabees, books of the Maccabees, okay? If you haven't read them, give them a read. They're very informative. They're long, but they, they, they explain a lot. They give you a nice backdrop to the, um, you know, culture and atmosphere and, and happenings of the times just before Jesus, the couple centuries before so when he comes along and sends this, you know, this great gospel commission out to the lands to gather the Israelites and the main message is that he's forgiven our trespasses of the law. And then at the very end, you see only Israel standing redeemed, having been forgiven. And you see Jesus say he only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You can understand exactly what's going on and it makes perfect sense. And that whole thing about Antiochus setting up altars to unknown foreign pagan gods all over the empire and how the Jews would have likely most assuredly taken part in that because they were you know of course being threatened and they were just wanting to be one with society for political reasons and you know they spoke the language many of them spoke Greek right and that was some four or five generations before the time of Christ so think about what that amount of time will do and how deeply immersed in that culture and everything you would be by the time Christ comes along. That's the whole story, folks. That's the whole story. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed it. I didn't go too deep because I'm driving. and I'm just trying to recite things that I'm remembering as well as read a few notes here that I jotted down about these books. 
And uh, yeah, folks, so uh, give it a like. If you did enjoy it, please hit the thumbs up and we'll be back another day, another time, another place, another rhyme. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.